Hello, hello, and welcome to Gen Chem with Dr. J. I'm Dr. Janita Pritchett, and we'll be talking about all things chemistry related on this channel. In this video, we're going to be learning all about the metric system and how we can convert between different units that are found within the metric system and apply it to a number of different things. Let's get to it. So one of the great things about using the metric system in chemistry or in a science field is that we can relate units that are found within that international system or the SI system uh, through a base 10 system. And so all units of the SI system are related to a standard unit by a power of 10. And that power of 10 is indicated by a prefix multiplier. So if we memorize what these prefixes are and what power of 10 they're associated with, it makes doing unit conversion very simple. Now, the prefix multipliers are always the same regardless of the standard unit. So whether we're talking about millimeters or millimeters or milligrams, every time we hear that prefix milli, that should trigger something to us that this unit is related to this specific, specific power of 10. Now, when we write out a, a, a measurement or report it out, we're going to report that measurement with a unit that is close to size, the size of the quantity being measured. Shown for you here is a table that lists several common prefix multipliers in the SI system. Now understand that there are a multitude of different tables out there and this table can expand higher and lower um, well beyond what is shown here. But this is really representing those that you're going to commonly expect to see in a classroom environment. And so how this table is read, and I always like to delve into this a bit um, because sometimes students have a little bit of difficulty of, with what they know versus what they're reading. Um, so it's really important to make sure we understand what this table is saying. So what this table is saying is that we have this, um, this series of prefixes that exist. So that's what's found on the left-hand side. And so these pre prefixes with these associated symbols are equivalent to some power of 10 of that base unit. So the base unit could be anything. It could be meters, grams, liters. It could be anything that we want to apply this to. Okay, but once we've memorized this, we can easily put it into motion. So how this particular table is written is that it is saying that one of this prefix, so if we have one of this prefix, one milli, one centi, one micro, whatever you want to call it, it is equal to this number of the base unit, okay? And so that helps us as we're thinking about how we would apply that is if I can memorize this table, then I can easily apply this to any base unit, okay? Now, remember I said that students tend to have a little difficulty with this understanding this table and what they commonly know, right? So if you look at the centi row, I want to just point out there, for cent or the prefix centi, a lot of times you think of 100. But when I read this table, it says that one centi is equal to 10 to the negative two of that base unit. Well, that should make sense. That's the same as saying one penny is equal to one one hundredth of a dollar. But just because we can think of it that way doesn't mean we couldn't think of it the opposite way and saying, well, how many pennies are in a dollar? In one dollar, there would be a hundred pennies. And so neither of those is more correct than the other. It's just a matter of reframing how we're thinking about it, okay? So I wanna show you an example just to really make sure we are properly understanding how to read that base unit table, okay? So for instance here, I want you guys to think about it. Which would be bigger, a gram or a milligram? Well, we know that a gram is far bigger than a milligram. So if this represents one gram, a milligram would be obviously not drawn to scale, but it would be much smaller. And you want to ask yourself, how is this table worded? How do I digest this table? Well, there are two different ways we can think about this. If I ask you how many of these milligrams can fit into a gram, you would say, well, a lot of them. You know, I could fill this whole thing in. And so much to, I could say that in one gram, there are a thousand milligrams. Anytime we hear that word thousand, that milli idea, we know there's a thousand of something there, okay? Well, in um, scientific notation, a thousand would be written as one gram is equal to one times ten to the third milligrams, okay? We could also look at it from the flip side and think about it from the prefix side, the milligram. In one milligram, how many grams could fit in there? Well, in your mind, you should be saying not a lot. Only a small fraction of that big gram can be pushed into that little milligram. How much? Only a thousand. 
So we would say that one milligram is equal to one one thousandth of a gram. So it's a fraction of it. Only a portion of that big gram can fit in there. And if we look at that in scientific notation, that's like saying one milligram is equal to one times 10 to the negative third grams. Both of these uh, ways of thinking are correct. So it's a matter of you deciding which route do you wanna go. So the take home message from this slide is if you're using that table that I showed in the previous slide, you're gonna be looking at it from this perspective, asking yourself, what is it the base unit equal to in that one prefix? So one of the prefix equals this amount of the base unit. Uh, if you have used other tables or you like thinking about it in terms of the base unit, how many of the prefix can fit in the base unit, then you're going on the route that I have listed to the left. Both are correct, so I advise you pick which way works and run with that, okay? So again, if you're using this table, you're always gonna say one of the prefix is equal to that number that's shown on the right of the base unit. And we'll do some examples here in a second. One way we can apply this is by using dimensional analysis or what I like to call the given and find method. And so when we're doing these conversions, the method that we're gonna be using, we're gonna be given some information, something we're starting with and something that we're trying to solve for. And we ask ourselves, can I do this in one step? Is there a linking unit between one and the other? And if there is a direct comparison, in our case, that metric system uh, table, you can simply take the units of your given and you're going to put that unit on the bottom along with the value. And then what we're trying to solve for up on top. And we'll be able to simply calculate out what we're trying to solve for. Uh, moral of the story is whenever you're using this, you want to make sure that you're putting it in your calculators correctly. I've seen so often students will set this up and they actually don't know how to put it in their calculators. So I advise you to get your given and find and you're going to always first multiply by anything that's on the top and then divide by anything that you find on the bottom. Okay. Um, and the beauty of this given and find system is that let's say that you don't know a direct conversion from the thing that you're starting with your given to the thing that you're trying to solve for the find. You can set up multiple of these dimensional analysis setups in order to find or solve for the appropriate unit. Okay, so this can kind of go on as long as needed. Okay, so let's do a quick example here. Let's say that I have 32.5 nanometers and I want to know how many meters that is equivalent to. And so I would set and ask myself, do I know a direct conversion between nanometers and meters? And the answer is yes. And I would then go about setting up my dimensional analysis. So 32.5 nanometers. And I know that there is a single conversion between nanometers to meters. So I'm going to only have one conversion step shown. I'm going to put my nanometers on the bottom because that's what I want to get rid of, the given. I'm going to put my meters on the top because that's what I want to solve for. And then I'm going to fill it in as such. Well, on that table, it told me that one nanometer is equal to one times 10 to the negative nine meters. So I would put the one on the bottom with the nanometer. 10 to the negative nine on the top with a meter. And again, I'm dropping that one because it's not necessary in the calculation. And then I'm going to plug this in. Remember, as I'm putting this in the calculator, rather than going up and down, up and down, I'm just gonna simply do 32.5 times one to the times 10 to the negative nine divided by one. And that gets us, when we plug this into our calculator, what we end up getting is 3.25 times 10 to the negative eight meters. And that checks out. Again, that makes sense because we know that a meter is much larger than a nanometer. And so we would expect when we're looking at that equivalence that we're gonna get a really small number out. That was a really easy example when we're dealing with a single step system. But what happens when we're dealing with something that requires more than one step? Well, we attack it the same way. For instance, if I had 4.52 picograms and I wanted to figure out how many micrograms there are, 
Well, I asked myself, do I know a direct conversion between these two things? And the answer is maybe no, I don't. But I do know I could go from picograms to grams because I know a conversion between those two. And then from grams to micrograms because I also know a conversion between those two. Coming up with this conceptual idea will help you lay out the framework for how you should be approaching these problems. So again, I'm going to start with my given, my 4.52 picograms. And then I always encourage my students, don't worry about putting the numbers in first. Put the units in first and then let that drive where the value should be going. So again, I have picograms on the bottom. Excuse me, I, I have picograms. I wanna get rid of picograms. So I'm gonna place that on the bottom. And my first step is to first go to grams. That's the linking unit between those two units. So then after I've gone to, from picograms to grams, I then can go from grams to micrograms. Now is where I will start filling in with the information. Again, from my chart, I would say that in one picogram is equivalent to 10 to the negative 12 grams. And then I would also say that one microgram is equal to 10 to the negative six grams. And I'd be ready to solve. Again, if you're thinking about things from the idea of the, how many picograms are in a gram or how many micrograms in a gram, you would flip the, where the ones are positioned, but you also need to make sure you flip the, the sign of that number. So if you're putting one with the gram, then on the bottom, you would put 10 to the negative 12 picograms. If you're putting one with the gram on the second one, then on the top would be 10 to the positive six. You got to make sure you change that sign. All right, so now we're ready to play, plug it into our calculators. Again, we want to make sure that we're multiplying across the top. So 4.52 times 1e e to the negative 12. And again, I'm using that e button to represent times 10 uh, divided by my 1e e to the negative 6. And again, we're, not, we're avoiding using the ones because those are ultimately going to cancel out. When I plug this into the calculator, I end up getting 4.52 times 10 to the negative 6 micrograms as my answer. Okay, And again, the units check out because our picograms have canceled, the grams have canceled, and we're left with our micrograms. Okay. All right. I do want to show you a few other units that you want to be familiar with in this chapter or really in the whole entire course. So volume is something that we measure a lot in this course, um, especially if we're taking in person labs. So remember, volume is just simply the amount. It's the measurement to define the amount of space that's being occupied. There are several different ways that volume can be measured or be represented. Uh, one is through the SI unit, which means that you're going to have a length based piece incorporated in there. Um, and that's based off of doing measurements similar to uh, the geometric shapes. So for instance, if we look to the left, we have a cube here that's in um, centimeters, X number of centimeters. And so the volume of this is equal to the length times the width times the height. So as a result, the volume comes out in units of centimeters cubed. So typically with solid materials, you're gonna have your volume reported as, mil as meters cubed, centimeters cubed or millimeters cubed. Uh, for liquids and gases, we commonly use the liter or milliliter unit designation. Um, and so you can see that we can easily convert from a milliliter to a centimeter cubed um, because they're, they're equivalent. One milliliter equals one centimeter cubed. Again, I highly recommend memorizing that conversion. Um, other common equivalents that you may use throughout the course um, are shown for you here. There's a variety of different length based equivalents. And um, in a few later videos, you'll see some examples where we're going to utilize these. Um, there's also some common units for both mass and volume and their respective equivalents shown here. So definitely snapshot these two images, these two tables, and you can use these throughout your course. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and learned all about the standard units of measurement. Stay tuned for the next videos and we'll see you soon. Bye.